we will get started. Uh, we are going through the prophets, and we started last week not with um, not with the order that they appear in the Bible, but with the chronological order. That's what's called. We started last week with the chronological order, going through the prophets, because most of the most of the difficulty in interpreting the tr- prophets is not knowing how they fit in historically. Uh, a good a good deal of them will will mention about um, what king was reigning, and that kind of helps because you can just go into like the book of Kings or Chronicles and kind of base it in that way. But um, kind of the, the overarching history of the setting is, is, I think, what really makes it seem, what really makes it pop out more. Um, and we're going to see that, how it uh, relates to uh, Daniel. But first, we'll start off with Nahum. Um, so Nahum what was about... 650 BC or so. Uh, this, if you remember, uh, Jonah had gone to Syria in about 770 or so. So here we've got about 100 years later, and Nahum is again sent to Assyria. Um, I, I'm guessing somewhere along the way they had gone back to living how it is that they lived, and uh, so the revival that they experienced did not extend past uh, really, I guess, that generation. So he's, Nahum is, is prophesying at the time that Assyria is still the main power, but Babylon is getting ready to come into the scene as a, as a main player. Um, they're beginning to rise to power. Um, and if you, as you read through Nahum, you can definitely tell that there's an anticipation of, of shift there. Um, so Nahum is to an audience that has, again, hardened their heart. And uh, something that's interesting is, as far as I'm aware of, there's no record of Assyria... Uh, having changed their gods. So that means that when, in the book of Jonah, when they repented, either it was not a long repentance, or they repented to the extent that Israel did, where they were trying to do the whole worshiping both gods system. Whatever happened there, um, it didn't really quite make it into a serious um, annals. So uh, it was at this time, Assyria is getting ready to kind of fold in on itself, that uh, the Chaldeans and the Medes uh, found an independent Babylon, and it starts kind of becoming more and more uh, a central focus. Babylon was actually considered uh, by the pagan peoples to be a, a, um, a holy city, a, 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 a spiritual place. So it was kind of not, not, it was kind of frowned upon to attack or to destroy Babylon. So there was at one point, shortly before Babylon's rise, where it had been destroyed, but then because of just people thinking that the gods were upset about it, they rebuilt Babylon, and then Babylon went on to conquer the known world. <laughs> so it kind of bit them in the, in the, well, in the butt, I guess. Uh, so, so what? What does it matter about the book of Nahum? Well, Nahum uh, was, it, it's kind of interesting when you think about this, because when we think of the prophets, maybe we think of, you know, the prophets to Israel, or the prophets to Judah, but most of the prophets actually were sent to Judah, and uh, very few of the prophets were sent solely to outside nations. Um, Jonah was not solely to outside nations, but his book was solely to an outside nation. Uh, Nahum was sent specifically to Assyria. Uh, uh, so that's pretty singular if you think about it. Uh, this, the prophets sent to Babylon, for instance, you had other prophets that were prophesying about other things, and then they also gave prophecies about Babylon. But with Nahum, he was sent specifically to Assyria, and uh, that's kind of unique there. Um, obviously, it was a second prophet sent, which is, again, pretty significant when you consider all the different prophets and all their different messages, and Jonah and Nahum specifically have books that were just to Assyria, um, who wasn't even part of the promise. Um, this isn't something that Babylon experienced or Persia, um, but Assyria got this singular treatment. Uh, at this point that Nahum was written, there was probably um, not, uh, not serious time to avoid the wrath of God that was coming. Um, it was probably just too late for that. But they still could have repented, um, even though they couldn't have averted the disaster, they could still have repented um, unfortunately, they did not. Uh, and so another thing that I think we can learn from Nahum is that the biggest powers on earth are nothing before God. 
and uh, nothing is too big or too small for God. And I think that's something we can definitely glean from uh, the book of Nahum. Uh, next up is the book of Habakkuk, um, which is to Judah, but it's about Babylon, so it's kind of to Babylon too, but mostly it's to Judah. Habakkuk prophesied about 630. Um, it's on the next. Good. Uh, about 630. Um, at this point, Assyria was falling apart. And uh, God was going to raise up the Babylonians to punish Judah. Uh, and so the main theme of the book is it may seem like evil is winning, but God is still in power. And what you see in the book of Habakkuk is, and I mentioned this quite a few times, the prophet is genuinely disturbed because there's so much um, evil and injustice in, his, in, his society, in, the, in the culture in Judah. And so he's crying out to God, how come you are not punishing the guilty? And God says, I'm going to punish them with the Babylonians. And Habakkuk just has a really hard time with this because the Babylonians are even more wicked than Judah. And so he's just, God, I don't understand this. How are you possibly doing this? Um, and it's in this midst of, of Habakkuk saying, I don't understand what you're doing. I'm going to keep guard and, 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 and watch for your answer, but I just don't understand this. It's right in that bit that God makes the statement, the righteous will live by faith. And uh, it's a very important kind of theme there. And you see Habakkuk at the very end of the book, he, he, write, he kind of writes this poem to God, and he says, look, even though all these things, bad things are going to happen, and all, all that that you're going to bring about, and, and let's say the, the trees stop producing, and, and you know we're just really in a bad place, I'm still going to trust in you. And uh, it's just such a climactic moment in the book. Uh, so th- obviously the main theme here is, yes, it does look like evil is winning. And that's, I think, something that, a lot of cultures have had to, or I guess you should say generations have had to deal with things where it really looks like evil is winning, but God is still in power. And um, very, I think Habakkuk might apply more to our generation um, with things that we're going through than to some other generations because it definitely does seem like, you know, evil is, is winning. Um, Uh, something to, interesting to note about this is that, yes, God was using the Babylonians who were more wicked than Judah, but he would in turn repay them for their um, wickedness as well as uh, for punishing uh, Israel. So he raised them up to punish the Judaites, but then he punished them for punishing them. <laughs> and uh, part of it was because Babylon had gone too far. Um, he had called them to, to bring Judah to punishment, but they had gone too far, done more than he called them to do. Uh, and so God held them even even worse off than they would have been. So uh, Habakkuk, Habakkuk did not understand. He was very fearful, but he stood in faith. So what? What does it matter that we have this book in our Bible? Well, I think there's a lot of things. And the first thing is that it may oftentimes seem that God is unfair, that uh, the world is evil and unjust, but God is in control. He's working for his own ends. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be saved from uh, situations that we don't want to go through, but it definitely does mean that even when we go through the situations, God is still able to to be there with us um you know so god's purposes don't always seem good to us i think that's uh, another thing we can learn from the book of habakkuk um definitely to the prophet it did not seem like what god's purposes were were good it seemed like god why are you letting this evil thing happen and it was something where habakkuk had to lean to lean into god in faith because he didn't understand why god would allow such a thing and uh, you definitely see a struggle with, with faith. And I think we all kind of get to these places and we don't like to admit them. Like, no, I, I don't struggle in my faith, but no, I think we all kind of do get to those places. Um, and Habakkuk definitely, excuse me, definitely was in that place. Um, and then uh, the last thing I think that's very singularly important about this book is the concept of the righteous living by faith. Um, you, you see it in Habakkuk, but there's just so many different applications. And in the New Testament, I think um, this one verse is quoted, I want to say, three times, uh, three or four times. Uh, so whatever happens, I will follow. It's a very, very big theme, um, especially keep in mind that um, a lot of the Israelites, like a lot of Christians today, have this idea that um, if we're God's people, everything's just going to work out, you know, and that's just not, just not true, um, just because God's with us doesn't mean things are just going to magically work out. I mean, we're going to go through some very dark times. And um, especially as we get closer to the end, there's somewhat of a misconception that the rapture is going to happen and save us from all unpleasantness. And that's not what the Bible shows us at all. We are going to have to go through a lot of unpleasantness. We don't know how long that unpleasantness goes on for. But then the rapture will happen, and the worst of it we'll, we won't be there for. But we will definitely have to be there for at least some of it. 
So the book of Zephaniah is next on the chronological list there. Uh, chronologically speaking, it's actually very close to Habakkuk. Um, Zephaniah was... Well, Zephaniah is too... Zephaniah is to Babylon in a way, but also kind of to Judah. It's one of those books too. Um, one of the one of the big things that you see, we're, we're just going to say it's to Judah. And uh, one of the big thing big things that you see is is when Assyria came in and destroyed Israel. Judah was very very close <laughs> to being destroyed as well. They really missed it by that much, and. Um, you know, they. What did they learn from that very close encounter? Absolutely nothing. Um, so here Zephaniah is uh, talking to Judah, and he's saying, you know, this is you're you're not really learning the lesson here. Um, so this is very short before um, before uh, Babylon conquers the area. So the first time Babylon conquers Judah is in six oh nine. 609 or 605, I forget. But so you can see that's within 20 years of this prophecy. Uh, things are going kind of rough there. So uh, who is King King Josiah? Now, this is very interesting because if you read in, in Kings, um, Josiah is leading a reform, and things are going very well. Um, there's spiritual revival. The law has been refound. Things are really seem, seeming to look up. Well, then uh, the Egyptian pharaoh decides to come through and do battle against the northern kingdoms. And Josiah, uh, Josiah, for whatever reason, gets it in his head that he's going to go and intervene in the situation for whatever reason. And, um, well, it doesn't go well for him. He dies. And it, it brings up a very interesting quandary of what would have happened uh, if he would have minded his own business just this time and let them do their little battle thing there. How much different would it have been um, for the for the nation? And we don't know. It's interesting to consider, but we don't know. So Judah had followed Israel's immorality. They hadn't learned a single thing, but another day of the Lord was coming. It it seemed like that the day of the Lord was when Israel had fallen, but Zephaniah gives us, no, 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 no. Um, That was definitely a day of the Lord, but there's still another day of the Lord. And just as there have been days of the Lord, there are still going to be more days of the Lord. Um, So it's very possible that uh, Zephaniah... Um, is related to King Hezekiah. It doesn't necessarily say that, but at the beginning he's saying this is very lengthy genealogy. What I mean by very lengthy is lengthier than the normal prophet genealogy is. Normally they say this person is the son of this person, or they don't say anything at all. But with him, he goes back a few different generations. I think it's four or five different generations to get to Hezekiah. And why would he do that unless he's trying to tell them this is King Hezekiah? The scholarship is divided, so it's not like this is a conclusive point, but it seems like that's what he's saying. So what about Zephaniah? What does it matter if it's in our Bible that we read it? Well, um, God's people really missed all the signs and warnings that God had sent. And uh, unfortunately, they saw their momentary um, revival and, and economic you know, things that were happening with the economy as signs that, that everything was, was good and it, it really wasn't. Um, God was giving another chance to get their attention and, and clue them in. Um, and many did turn, but uh, turn, but it really, it wasn't enough. Um, it got to the point where, um, and we're going to look at this in just a minute, God actually told Jeremiah, stop, stop trying to pray and intercede, even if the most righteous people were here, I still wouldn't turn. This is, this is, it, you're not, and nobody's avoiding this at this point. And uh, so, okay, that takes us to the prophet Jeremiah, who's prophesying, prophesying pretty much through this period, 627 to 580, and uh, you could say he's to Judah, and uh, I don't know why I said Zephaniah was to Babylon. He's to Judah. Um, Jeremiah was to Judah, um, but he has a lot of prophecies that are to other people. Now, it's important to note that Jeremiah didn't give each prophecy directly by himself. So in, in some of these cases, when it says that he gives a prophecy, sometimes they just turn in the direction of the nation that they're prophesying. And sometimes, as is the case of Jeremiah, he sends somebody else with the scroll and says, hey, read this to them. And um, so it, Jeremiah was not personally there for every single one of these prophesying it, although God did use him. Uh Jeremiah goes through Israel's fall, I'm sorry, Assyria's fall as well as Babylon's rise, and uh, then the book ends with him being taken into Egypt. Um, 
and Babylon is, is still in power. Uh, we don't know ultimately how long he lived, but he is considered to be one of the youngest prophets um, to have started. So he started at the youngest point. Uh, he's, cons- he's called the weeping prophet. Uh, he's probably... Hmm, He's probably the prophet that we see the most, understand what I'm saying here, but the most humanity from, and, and that he, we see a lot of his character flaws and a lot of his faults. Um, you know, he really struggled to be a prophet. He didn't always want to give messages. He didn't always want to, you know, wasn't always in the mood to do this whole thing of seeing people die and fall away from God. And he just kind of got burnt out of it a lot. And, um, I mean, obviously he prophesied for a long time. This was like a lifetime thing. Uh, he wanted to give up a lot. He was mistreated very badly. Um, he faced a lot of struggles that actually God called him to, uh, such as he was forbidden to marry, um, which was obviously a bummer for him. Uh, he lied to a series of politicians, <laughs> which how often can we say that we read of a prophet lying? <laughs> so uh, he, um, we have record of some of his uh, sins and uh, also a str- many struggles that he had with false prophets of the day. So it's a very, uh, very unique book in those aspects. Um, I don't think we see really with any of the other prophets that much um, of, a, of a battle going on. Uh, the, the book itself was, the original book was destroyed by King Jehoiakim, um, which is an interesting little bit of history. And so he had to re- rewrite the whole thing, uh, which had more prophecies in the end one than in the previous one. And... Uh, that presumably is the one that we have now. Obviously, it's been copied. It's not the original manuscript, but um, the, it's, it's interesting that the first one was destroyed. Um, Jeremiah was young when he started, but really, who knows how young. It could have been as young as in his 20s. It could have been in his mid-20s. Did I say that right? He could have been as in his teens or in his mid-20s. Yeah. And um, so that's fairly young. And as far as we know, he died in Egypt, which is kind of funny in a not funny way, uh, because they're all like, hey, um, so should we go to Egypt? And he tells them, no, you shouldn't go to Egypt. And they say, okay, well, we're going to go to Egypt now. Uh, And uh, it's actually because we listened to God in the first place that we're in this pickle, because we'd stopped worshiping those other pagan gods. And uh, Jeremiah's like, "Um, no, 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 that's that's not right. And there's like, "Ah, it's okay, it's fine. You come with us to Egypt, by the way. And he's like, well, I I don't think you should go to Egypt. And uh, they're like, well, yeah, we're going to go anyways, and you kind of come with us. And uh, so as far as we know, he never leaves Egypt. He's just out there (laughs) stuck, (laughs) and uh, he definitely didn't want to be there. Uh, by all accounts, his ministry was a failure, and and that's one of the things that I really liked about Jer- I really like about Jeremiah is, it, it really seems by everything that we hold, he was a failure. Um, he he gave messages, but people didn't listen. He hoped and he prayed, and it didn't do any good. The people still went into exile. They still didn't listen, and then they blamed him for it and persecuted him for it. He never had a big following. You know, that's everything that we would consider as a failure, but. Success is because he obeyed. God told him to do something, and he did it. Um, he didn't always do it uh, with the best of attitudes. He didn't always do it well, but he did it. Um, numbers are not definitely are definitely not a sign of obedience. Um, and I think this is reiterated in the New Testament. If you read First, Second, and Third John, you see they're written to the same church, but you see them slowly getting worse and worse. Uh, First John, you're like, okay, well things seem a little troubled at that church. Second John, you're like, okay, well things kind of are taking a downhill turn, and you get to Third John, you're like, wow, this is really not good for that church. And you see kind of the same thing uh, in Jeremiah. Um, it's definitely not uh, not a thing of numbers always being a sign that you are obeying God. Sometimes you obey him, and you do what he says, and it's still not enough to see a, a, um, a turnaround. But as we're going we're to look at in Ezekiel, just because, um, well, it wasn't the prophet's fault whether the people listened, it was a prophet's fault whether they obeyed. Um, something that's very interesting about the book of Jeremiah, and I've already mentioned it, uh, is that Jeremiah was actually multiple times instructed not to pray uh, for certain groups of people, um, which obviously I don't think we should see as normative, nor should we say, um, I don't think I should be praying for this group of people. Don't Don't get super spiritual and don't try to directly apply what the what god said to the prophet on that one situation to all of us yes you should pray for your enemies and bless those who persecute you that's not 
Just because you don't like somebody doesn't mean that you shouldn't be praying for them. That's not what he's saying at all. But it's very interesting that um, even if Jeremiah continued to pray and all these righteous people from history were there too, it still wouldn't have been enough for God to change his mind about what he was doing. So thing, things turned very bad for Judah very fast. Um, it had delayed for a long time, which is exactly what the prophet Habakkuk had said. He said, even though it delays, wait for it because it's coming. And that's exactly what happened. It delayed, it delayed, and then when it came, it came fast. And, uh, I mean, it just left complete destruction. And the thing that I find ironic, well, not ironic, but I don't know the right word on this situation. Um, crazy. We'll just go with that. The thing I find is crazy in the situation is, Ba- Judah fell in three different stages, 609 or 5 or somewhere around there, 597 and 586. It wasn't just a one-and-done kind of deal. And in each of the times that they were conquered, it, it got worse and worse for them with less and less people uh, left in the city and in the surrounding areas. And yet you don't really see people getting like, you know what? We might want to think about changing what we're doing. You, you still see them like holding onto their guns and no, this... We need to stay and see this through, and it's, it's crazy. Um, things turned very bad, very, very bad, very quickly. Um, so one th- uh, you definitely see in the book of Jeremiah that, that Judah experienced a lot of trouble within and everywhere without, even to the point that Edom was picking on them. And Edom was, was a very small country to their east, uh, and, and yet they're picking on them. And so when, when we get down to Obadiah, which is next week, I think, yeah, it's next week. Uh, Obadiah is actually one of the, is actually to Edom because of the things that they had done uh, during this period of time. And we'll look at that later, but um, moving on. As far as the 70 years, uh, there's a lot of disagreement as far as, because it doesn't seem to add up to 70 years. It appears as though the 70 years started at about 609 and went to 539. So... Uh, there are other interpretations, but that one seems the most um, the most likely. Uh, although still, it's not um, a little bit off there. It seems like it wasn't exactly 50 years because... So if anybody remembers, I want to say it's 605 that Babylon had, a f- had its first... Um, if anybody knows this history. Uh, I believe it was 605 that, that Babylon f- had their first conquering of Judah. Well, so then 70 years would have been 535, but they were allowed to return to the promised land by Persia in 539, which would mean that it would be 609, not 605. So uh, obviously there's a little bit of a, a little bit of an issue there. there. There's a lot of different options, but that seems like a longer discussion than we really have time for. So eh, it is what it is. Some words uh, from the prophet sound contradictory in light of the false prophet messages. So if you read through and you read what the false prophets say, and then you go back and you read what Jeremiah prophesied, sometimes it sounds like he's kind of caving to what they're saying, kind of tweaking his message to fit what the false prophets are saying. Um, But it's important to realize that just because a false prophet gives a word doesn't mean that a similarity in God's word is God caving to it. It's just that sometimes even the wrong is going to be right partially. Part of the time. Is that going to make sense? So as you go through there, you're going to see that, but you'll probably catch up by yourself. Uh, there's a lot of valuable lessons in the book of Jeremiah about the deceitfulness of sin. So one thing, you see this in a couple different examples, but one is uh, the king Zedekiah, who's one of the last kings of Judah. And he goes and he asks the prophet, hey, what should I do here? And Jeremiah and him have seemingly good conversations. It seems like Zedekiah listens and he hears, but then he fails to actually follow through. He's kind of spineless. He doesn't really follow what God warns him about, and he definitely pays the price for it later on. Um, But you see that that's something that that sin does. It catches us in in being indecisive rather than following the word of the Lord. Another example of this is where the the Israelites are trying to figure out whether they should go to Egypt or not. So they're like, hey, um, Jeremiah, you know, give his wisdom in this. And so he does, and then they turn right back around and say, the reason why we're in this pickle is because of Yahweh. We're not going to listen to you. We're going to go to Egypt anyways. So you definitely see in Jeremiah, it, there's a lot of, of, it shows us a lot of how sin kind of ensnares us. So what, what does it matter if we read Jeremiah? What does it even matter that we have it? Well, Jeremiah 
had a long uh, ministry of trying to get people to repent, grieving for them, uh, and after they were des- re- destroyed, giving them hope. So I think for that, it's very valuable as a, as a means of, of helping us to see it through to the end. Those of us who are in ministry, see it through to the end. And, uh, I mean, we're, I guess we're all in ministry, though. So, you know, that we see things through to the end. Um, even as they were kidnapping him and taking him to Egypt, he, he still is trying to point them to God. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from that. And so Daniel is, is the second to last one we're going to look at. Um, it, it, these last two are probably the two most misinterpreted and misunderstood prophets of the Bible. Uh, maybe even books. Well, no, because Revelation is pretty misused and, and misunderstood. So I would say if I had to have a list of the top five books that are, that are misunderstood, there's going to be Revelation is going to be number one, followed very closely by Song of Solomon, uh, then probably Ezekiel, then probably Daniel. Yeah, that's probably right. So Daniel is written to the remnant. Um, he's in exile in Babylon, and uh, he's pretty much prophesied. But, you know, it's a lot of the content, and content isn't actually him prophesying to the remnant so much as him prophesying to people. Like, uh, for instance, he prophesies to the king of Babylon or to the other king of Babylon. You know, these different people. That, but then you see him, the book goes to the remnant, but a lot of its content is about the kings of Babylon. So it's kind of weird there. Uh, and it's also to Persia in a, in a way, I guess you could say. He prophesied from 605 to 530. And um, so he went through Babylon's empire and then into Persia's empire. Um, largely, this book is what would be considered apocalyptic literature. And I think that's the reason why it's so hard to understand in parts. Um, it's much different from the rest of the Old Testament, and it's also much different than the non-biblical books that are called apocalyptic literature. Um, they tend to be a lot more um, mystical. But uh, so, so like Revelation is probably the only real example from the New Testament of apocalyptic. Um, Daniel is one of the strongest examples of apocalyptic. Um, and uh, what that means is that the content is more mysterious, requiring an interpretation. So if you remember uh, when... Daniel's having some of his prophecies. He doesn't understand what's being said, and he falls on his face, and an angel has to come and kind of explain to him what's being said. That that kind of is how um, apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature is. It's very important to remember that, that usually apocalyptic stuff is not literal. Like if you go through Revelation and think, take everything as literal, you're going to be in quite a bit of a pickle trying to figure out and make heads and tails of this because you've got these weird monsters uh, who are all over the face of the earth which are obviously not um, to be understood literal, but if you try to make it literal, it's going to be kind of hard to understand what's being said. Um, what else? Uh, non-biblical apocalyptic books uh, were written by were not written by who they claimed to be written as. So they would say, like, for instance, the book of Moses, and it wasn't really written by Moses. Um, they were written after the fact in a form of prophecy where, I forget what it's called, but it's basically where you take an event that's already passed and you write a, you have a prophecy that relates to it, but it's written after the fact. And that's just kind of the style of how it's written. Um, one thing that you see in Daniel that I think is, is oftentimes misunderstood is when it's talking about the kings of the north and the kings of the, kings of the south. This is one of the, one of the biggest uh, misquoted verses by televangelists uh, to talk about, um, you know, the different kings and how it applies to America. When actually the kings of the north and the kings of the south are referring to the, king, to the Greek empire. So after Alexander the Great swept through and conquered their own world... He died in 331 like, or something like that. And really right after he, he conquered most of the world, he was fighting in India, I want to say. And his army was like, yeah, we're getting kind of tired of this whole constant warfare thing. We kind of toned it down a little bit. And Alexander's like, now nah, we're good. We're, gonna keep, we're just going to keep going until we all die. And then he dies. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was foul play or not. I don't know. But either way, uh, the area around Israel was, was separated into two of his... Um, Two of his generals, his empire was divided among his generals. And so there was the, oh, geez, I don't know if I can remember their names, the Seleucids and the, uh, I don't remember. Moral of the story being, those were the kings of the north and the kings of the south. They had this war going on uh, over the promised land. Um, their, their lines were always kind of shifting. And Daniel gives a very good detail of, of what was about to happen with, those, with the Greek empire fighting over the promised land. And then after, the, after Daniel, that actually happened, which is amazing because even if you take it at the very tail end of his prophecies during the Persian empire, 
The Greek Empire still hadn't conquered. We still had like 200 years before this ever happened. So, you know, this detail about the North and South King, it's very, very interesting. Excuse me, excuse me, very interesting. Um, an outline for the book that is kind of helpful, and I, I've kind of avoided outlines for the prophetic books because it's kind of unhelpful to have an outline for these books. But um, there's a very cool chiasm between chapters 1 and, th- one and 7 where, and, and I'm not going to, no spoilers here, but go back and read Daniel 1 through 7 and kind of, you can see it there, how it kind of starts and ends with the same themes and it has a central point there towards the middle of the section. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening there. And then the last couple chapters aren't a part of the chiasm. And I'll encourage you to go explore as to why that is. Um, okay. So that you have, like, for instance, the vision of the four kingdoms at the, that start off the section and end the section. Um, Jesus appears in the book of Daniel, which is very interesting, as the son of man. Um, and then also uh, the father is there as well with the Ancient of Days. There's a whole dia- dialogue between the two of them. Or not really dialogue, more of just, well, I guess it kind of is. Um, the d- abomination of desolation is mentioned. This is interesting because it's going to be fulfilled uh, by Rome and uh, by some other things. But then Jesus talks about the coming abomination of desolation, which obviously implies that it had not been fulfilled, which is a very interesting thing, very interesting thing. Uh, and for that, prophecy is oftentimes like mountain peaks. They'll have multiple um, fulfillments and stuff. Very interesting stuff. Um, Some major themes of the book, uh, prayer. Prayer is a huge theme in the book. God as being sovereign, absolutely. But I think the biggest theme in the book would be human pride. You see it as a a recurring theme. Daniel is kind of like God's fight against the most prideful people in the world. Um, Belshazzar uh, is mentioned as, um, let's see, what am I saying here? Belshazzar is mentioned as Nebuchadnezzar's son. This doesn't seem true because we think in literal terms in English. But so whereas a son to us means a direct descendant, like Micah is my son, the term is oftentimes used in more of these ancient languages that means more of um, ancestor. So like my, my father is Randy. Okay, we could say that Micah is Randy's son. It would be the exact same. That's how they use that word. Um, so they use it differently than ours. It doesn't mean there's a contradiction. It just means that they use words differently. Um, another thing th- to mention, uh, because it, it's been brought up, which is very interesting. So culture forgot that Babylon and Persia, they forgot that they were even a thing. They forgot about their empires completely. And so then the Bible mentioned these empires, and like that that's not real. Those empires didn't exist. Well, so then archaeologists came along and they found proof of it. Oh, these empires did exist. So now they go to the other extreme and say, oh, well, the Bible is giving false details about it. It's like, well, now hold on. Uh, that's not true, first off. And then second off, don't forget that until recently, we didn't even know that Babylon and Persia even existed. So let's kind of dial it down there. Um, one way we know that uh, Daniel was actually there is he says very clearly when Belshazzar is going to reward Daniel, he says, I will make you the third in the land. Why did he say that? Because he was only the second in the land. His father, Nabopolassar, I think, uh, was out in the desert worshiping the moon god uh, when Babylon was conquered. And so, uh, so Belshazzar was only the, th- the second in the land, so he could only give to Daniel the rank of third because he couldn't promote him past himself. Uh, well, I guess he could, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, um, Daniel is an, an, another interesting thing about the book of Daniel is it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic, um, which has caused a lot of controversy about the book, which we do not have time to get into. But uh, long story short, people are trying to obviously disprove Daniel like they do with every other book of the Bible. No real big um, ah, thing there. It mentions four kingdoms with the, uh, with the statue. Those four kingdoms are Babylonia, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Um, there's obviously some people who kind of take it for more mystical things. But in the context of Daniel, it's very obvious that those are the four kingdoms that are mentioned. Um, there's no record of Nebuchadnezzar's madness. Here's another little thing that people like to um, cry. You know, it's contradiction that the Bible is not, not true. Um, the, there's a lot of reasons why Nebuchadnezzar's madness would not be recorded. I'll give you two, though. First off, uh, typically... Well, I'll give you three reasons. First off, typically you wouldn't record things that made your empire seem weak. That'd be the first thing. Second off, 
So, how to say this? With, with Nebuchadnezzar, let me say it like this. So, there's very little that has actually been recovered, historically speaking. We have a wealth of knowledge, but the grand majority of, of the ancient Near Eastern world and, and around there has not actually been excavated. So there's a lot of records we don't have because they just haven't been found yet. I mean, think about it. There's, uh, the weather over there is, is crazy. You can't save every single record for hundreds and thousands of years. Plus, of all the wars that have happened over there, I mean, come on. Just uh, let's let's just take a brief glimpse and remember that Napoleon Bonaparte went marching through Egypt and destroyed all kinds of stuff there, and then after him there was like you know the World Wars and there was all kinds of stuff there. Not to mention the medieval times with all that nonsense that happened. And then to say we have every single record is a little bit mm, silly. We're no, no, we're we're never going to have all that. And then the third thing to keep in mind about his whole madness is that. In the latter years of Nebuchadnezzar's um, reign, we have very limited details of, of his reign. So it's very possible that in that time period that we just have almost nothing there, that's, that could have been when his madness was. So the, those three things, I think, should kind of address that. Uh, the, la the next thing to mention that seems like a historical wrongness is that Cyrus is the one that conquered Babylon. But in the, book of, in the book of Daniel, it says that Darius did. Well, Darius came later than Cyrus. And so why this contradiction or this, this historical wrongness? Uh, it could, there's, there's a few things that I've written down here that are, that are worth mentioning. First off, it could be a throne name. Darius could be a throne name. And sometimes they had numerous names that they would go by. That's totally possible. Next off, it could be a conqueror of Babylon, the, the specific, maybe the... Maybe the, the specific person who actually marched into the gates, like the military conqueror. Um, it could be um, could be a governor of Babylon. Any of these options are are plausible. Um, I just don't think I think it's a huge mistake whenever you you instantly hop to the idea of the Bible's wrong. You know, and obviously atheists are always doing that. But it's like, well, you know, probably best to slow down and kind of just think a little bit before you just instantly hop to it's wrong. Especially since we weren't there, and by all accounts, it seems like they were there. <laughs> so what, what does it matter that Daniel is in our Bible? Well, God calls us to courage in unsure days. Um, and that's not because we aren't afraid, but because he is in control. And we definitely see Daniel numerous times in the book being afraid. But we definitely just do still see God um, in control through it. So very interesting things happening there. Um, before we go on to Ezekiel, I want to mention uh, oftentimes, especially in, in the Western world, we break up the prophets of the Bible from major prophet, minor prophet. The reason why we do that is because the major prophets tend to be longer books, and they tend to ha um, the prophets tended to have prophesied for a longer period of time in them. That's not always the case, as you run into books like Hosea that has, like I think, 14 chapters, and then Daniel only has like 12. So it's not always the case, but it is the general uh, rule of thumb there. So Ezekiel is also written to the remnant, a lot like Daniel. Um, his prophecies are concerning others, though. But as I mentioned with uh, Jeremiah, he didn't necessarily give them all face to face. He prophesied in about 593 to 570. He was a um, priest um, from before the exile. Oh, here's something that, uh, worth mentioning. A lot of times the prophets will quote each other. Ezekiel does it quite a bit, and really a lot of the prophets do this. Um, actually, there's a lot of a lot of the Bible, by and large, that is quoted. They quote each other. So there's Obadiah is quoted in Jeremiah. Um, Ezekiel quotes um, Jeremiah as well as uh, Isaiah. I'm not going to try and remember them all because that's going to take too long. I, my brain's all, ah. <laughs> Long story short, the prophets always, you know, oftentimes quoted each other. And you even see this in the New Testament. So if you read the book of Jude, and then you read maybe Second Peter chapter 2 or First Peter chapter 2, one or the other, um, it's pretty much the entire book of Jude is the chapter 
Um, just there's a few things added, but it's basically like a repetition. Um, and there's a lot of that in the Bible, too. So uh, Ezekiel is oftentimes a misunderstood book. Um, for instance, it's been used to validate the claim that there are aliens, which, I mean, if you believe in aliens, that's your business, but Ezekiel is not talking about aliens. Um, it's it's not. Uh, the part that is quoted as, as, as saying that it's talking about aliens, it's actually talking about the glory of the Lord. Uh, it's at the beginning of the book. It describes it with like this this spinning um, spinning wheel uh, with the eyes on it, and some people ah oh, that that sounds like a like a like a UFO ship, okay. But it it very clearly says at the beginning and the end of the chapter that it's talking about the glory of the Lord. So the context always dictates meaning, and so obviously we can't make that mean that it's talking about aliens. Once again, if you want to believe about aliens, that's your own business, but don't use Ezekiel um, like that. Um, one thing that is very tragic that happens in the book of Ezekiel is his wife dies, and he is not allowed to grieve about it. Um, and the, his lack of mourning was a sign. And what a difficult thing for God to call you to. And uh, shoo-wee. Uh, but it's very, very um, interesting some of the things that God calls the different uh, prophets to. Another thing that God called Ezekiel to um, he actually uh, went to God and begged for, him, for God to change his mind, so God allowed for a substitute. Uh, and with that, God told him to do something that was unclean. He was supposed to use human dung. And Ezekiel said, I have never done anything unclean. He, please don't make me do this. And he says, okay, you can substitute. I think it says cow dung for it. But um, just a very interesting thing um, that happens there. And it, Ezekiel records the whole thing. It's very very interesting. I think sometimes if we just slow down when we're reading the Bible, I think we're going to get a lot more from it. There's a lot of really really interesting things that happen. Um, one thing that's kind of troublesome about the book of Ezekiel is that the temple that he prophesies about ne- was never never built. So um, it's in around chapter 40, I guess, um, and it goes for quite a, quite a few chapters talking about how the sacrifices are going to get reinstituted, the temple is going to get rebuilt, all these different you know details. Um, which is very, very interesting, um, but once again failed to be rebuilt. So there's a couple different um, explanations that people have given, and I'll give them to you. Uh, the first one is that it was fulfilled, but it was fulfilled with the with the small, pitiful temple that was built in the book of uh, Ezra. No, Nehemiah. No, Ezra. Uh, but built in the book of Ezra. But the problem there is that the dimensions are wrong. Like really wrong. the The temple that was built in Ezra was small. Uh, it was kind of unsignific- insignificant, and not great to look at. It wasn't like, oh, look at this m- amazing feat of engineering. It was more like, well, it's got a roof on it. You know, have you ever had your first your first starter house? <laughs> it's kind of like that. Uh, in fact, it was rebuilt by Herod um, to be a little bit more impressive. Uh, and by the time of Jesus, it was impressive. He was like, well, look at this. <laughs> And Jesus is like, see all these stones? Not one of them is going to be left on each other. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, but either way, that doesn't seem like the, does not seem like it was fulfilled because the dimensions are definitely wrong. The second explanation, the temple is still coming. Well, then you have the problem that that would mean that the sacrifices of the law are coming back as well. Why would the sacrifices be reinstated? We've got Jesus now. You can't get saved by going back to the sacrificial system. So that's, a, that's something that had to be answered. The third solution, it was prophetic, not literal, in, an, in regards to the church. So the church is the fulfillment of the temple that was never rebuilt. That doesn't make sense for, because it was very much so worded specifically. And so yeah, it, it seems like it's a bit of a leap. The next option, which I think is the fourth, one, two, three... I think it's four. Uh, it was partially fulfilled before, and then there's going to be a greater fulfilling that comes later. That one's possible, absolutely, because um, the the Israelites, when they went back, they rebuilt the temple. It was small, but they rebuilt it, and they did start the sacrifices again. So that would, you know, seem to fit there. Um, as far as um, are we looking in anticipation to Israel now, today, still building a new temple? No, we are not, as Christians, we're not looking forward with anticipation to a new temple. No, because we're looking forward to the coming Christ, not for not for that. 
Um, the Bible never once actually tells us to look forward and hope to the coming temple. So there's a lot of different televangelists you guys are going to hear. They're going to talk about all these. They're always going to be keeping their eyes open for these different fulfillments of prophecy and whatnot. It's not a good thing for the Israelites to go back to the temple and back to the sacrifices. It's a good thing for them to come to Jesus, which is exactly the message of Peter um, when he was back then. So then the, then the final option uh, that I know of, that I'm aware of for the temple being fulfilled is that it is symbolic. And so in that sense, he's using tangible things um, to explain the things of God. So using this is a good example for you to, to, to learn what I'm trying to teach you. And I guess that that one's possible. Um, if I had to pick, I would say it seems most likely it's one of the last two, that either it has been partially fulfilled and is going to be fulfilled to a greater degree later, and what that means for the sacrifices, I don't know. Um, or it was symbol- a symbolic temple that wasn't actually going to have a literal construction. I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll know when it happens. <laughs> so what, what does it matter that we have the book of Ezekiel? Well, a few things. First off, Ezekiel teaches us more about God's heart in punishing people and, and in judgment than anywhere else. Um, for instance, it's in Ezekiel that he says, you know, God has no pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. Um, which is very interesting because we read it in a lot of other places and it seems like God's just waiting to to destroy and bring punishment. And Ezekiel contradicts that idea. Uh, it also is, an, is the only major source of the great temple that was never built. So out of all the Bible, if you were to take away the end chapters of Ezekiel where he's prophesying about the temple, you would be left, you could remove it from the rest of the Bible and the rest of the Bible would fit together perfectly fine. It is our only and greatest source of that temple that was never built, which is very interesting to uh, to ponder. And now, obviously, I don't know the full conclusions of what that pondering means, <laughs> but it is still worth you know thinking about and considering that that this temple that was never built it's 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 like when you're reading Exodus, just like when you're reading through Exodus. You're reading about how they're going to build this tabernacle, and then there's this whole thing with the calf, and it seems like God's going to just wipe out the whole nation. And then it picks right back up, and they're building the tabernacle. And if you were just to take those chapters out, you wouldn't even know that they ever happened. The chapters just fit perfectly smoothly together. It's almost like an aside or a, uh, an interruption to the story. And that's a lot like what the great temple of Ezekiel seems like. You're going through this thing, and it all you know, seems to fit, and then you get this, like, it seems like it just, you have a problem that can't be resolved quickly and easily. What's the news with this temple? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And as far as I know, there's no major consensus among scholars either. Um, so, anyways. And the third, and last thing to mention about Ezekiel is Ezekiel was responsible for giving the word, and I mentioned this already, he, not for them receiving the word. And also, uh, which was kind of an important deal to Israel, they were complaining because they said the whole reason why we're being punished is because something wrong that our parents did. And so Ezekiel goes on this long thing talking about this proverb about our parents have eaten grapes and our teeth are set on edge and talking about the way, no, you will be held responsible for your own sin, not for the sins of your father. And it's really some interesting um, philosophical debates um, that are happening in the book of Ezekiel. So any questions with any of these prophets or anything that was said? So there are some people who have said that. Yes, I would disagree. I, I would disagree. I don't see any biblical warrant for that. What I see is when the rapture is getting, this is perfect time for the rapture, that nothing else has to be done. Um, as, far as, as far as biblical prophecy, I see nothing that has been unfulfilled that he, he could come, and we're not waiting for a temple to be rebuilt. You can come right now. Where's what coming from? I think... They're getting it at least partly from the book of Ezekiel and saying, well, it must be then because it wasn't before. And I think they're just drawing conclusions like that for a lot of it. Um, Usually when people come to their own conclusions about some things, they'll take a lot of different verses and take them out of context to apply to what they're talking about. So that's probably not the only place they're getting it from. They're probably getting it all throughout and different things. And I think that a lot of times they exclude the idea of the millennial reign of Christ. I think that they just... Let's do away with that, and let's have it where it just goes from this to let's drop the rapture. Let's just say it goes from this to the end times to the new heavens and new earth or whatever. Um, and so they do a lot of different 
Unfortunately, let me just say this. I think this is a better way of saying it than what I'm trying to say. The end times is probably one of the greatest points of division among Christians. Uh, and the interesting thing is, like, nobody knows. You know what I mean? Everybody thinks that they know. Like, oh, my view is the right. I mean, you have John Hagee, for instance. The last, like, 15, 10 years of his ministry has been solely on the end times. 15, year, 15 years of his ministry has been solely on the end times. Um, and that's just not a good idea because we don't know until we've seen it. You know what I mean? Like the, the Jews, they knew about the Messiah. Then the Messiah came and they were a little bit off base there. I think the same thing is happening now. Everybody has their own idea of this is what, and you just don't, nowhere does it say, like for instance, let, let's look at Jesus, a great example. Okay, so these are the things that will happen, but the end's not yet. And then there's this that will happen, but that's just the birth pains, the end's still not yet. And then there's this, and that will be when it, and nev- never in there anywhere does he say, and the temple has to be rebuilt before the end comes. He never says that, you know. And so then you get to the book of um, where the books of, of Paul, where he's talking about the end times. He once again never says that anything to do with the temple. He says what we're waiting for is the person of of what is he, he uses a word the person the man of of something. Um, what's the term that he uses? Basically, for for the for the antichrist to be revealed. Where once that happens, then the great falling away is going to happen, and then the rapture happens then. And he, and he talks about it there, and I think it's in one of the Thessalonians, and he never again says anything about the temple being, being rebuilt. So then these people get on TV, and they, and they have all their perfect designs and, 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 and uh, charts. This is uh, the perfect timeline and chart of the end times. It's just it's foolishness. Like Anybody who says that they know it with complete under, understanding is just, they're just being silly. You don't. You just don't. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, what were you going to say? <laughs> right. <laughs> they were on. They were on a mission to wipe everybody out. Uh, in fact, Habak- Habakkuk talks about this. Um, the prideful person keeps on not being satisfied. He's like death. He keeps reaching for more and more and more, and then his destruction comes on us very, very quickly. That's what Habakkuk prophesied. So yes, Babylon was completely unaware that they were being used by God to bring about his purposes. They thought they were going their own way, which is exactly the same thing that God does to us individually. We think, oh, I've got my own path figured out. Meanwhile, we're completely unaware that God's working it all out to his own purposes anyways. (laughs) Not that there's no such thing as free will or choice, but um, God has a way of working around and and countering and, 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 and what's the word? Taking into account our stupidity and our sinfulness. He's already taken into account. He's already there. He already sees how it goes. So, yes, absolutely. Um, anything else? No? Okay. Uh, la- next week we'll finish up the, um, the prophets, and we'll look at Lamentations as well. And then after that we'll probably only need a couple more weeks into May, and we'll be done with, um, with the Bible. And you'll have your Sunday nights back. <laughs> Until the next thing. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for um, speaking to us uh, and giving us, you know, uh, your heart, God, that, that we can read in your word and learn about you and learn about your desires and what pleases you and that uh, we can have such wisdom and direction and guidance um, from you, God, directly from God, that, um, that, that, that your heart has not been hidden from us, but you have revealed it to us. I pray that you'd continue to build unity in your church, continue to build purpose and direction that we would uh, love Roswell greater tomorrow than we did today, and uh, that we would be your hands and feet in the area, Lord. We love you. Amen.